this segment of Motorcycle Madhouse, you hooligans, we got a special guest today. We got Judge, and you guys loved his video he did on uh, the state of brotherhood. And we're going to be uh, getting a little bit more in-depth into that subject. It's always great to have Judge on. He is a fan favorite. How you doing, Judge? Well, I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Like we were talking off air, man. These damn freaking mixers suck. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you get what you pay for. Right. Well, you know, it seems every time you get the damn thing dialed in, because we do it for the radio part of the show, not uh, the video, because there's just, right. you know, I need an 8, uh, 10 channel uh, mixer if I was going to do it to both. But we do it to uh, radio because we got to do a specific thing for Spotify and Anchor now that we're sponsored for them. And it's just nuts, man. I, I can't stand it. it. It drives me nuts. But uh, Well, it's the same as getting a sound bar for your TV. I've been through two of them in two years. All right. Because they just quit working. You know? <laughs> well, you know what? The, la you know, the last uh, video that you did... It really got some fan uh, reaction, man. Everybody loves you to death, man. They think you're uh, down to earth. You tell it straight up. But I always say that of Vietnam uh, vets. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. You know, I mean, I, I, um, I've i got filters. Uh, but at the same point, uh, there's only certain places I use them. And it's generally not ever talking to a, a fellow rider or certainly a brother. Right, right. Well, you know what, because uh, I did have some questions, and I ain't going to say the club, but a lot of people heard that out of that uh, group, and you know what, I actually got to talk to somebody on West Coast that knew you and knew of you and said you were a stand-up guy, and I have to tell the people, this is a one-percenter club that's well freaking known that Judge was a part of, so I just wanted to get that. Uh, pushed aside and that uh, fake news, if you would, debunked. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole thing, you know. I mean, <clears throat> somebody asked me a question. I will answer that question if I feel they have a need to know it. I mean, if it's uh, uh, just somebody from a, a Facebook group, um, not necessarily, but um, um, the, the two people in mind, Shamu and Shamu 2, <laughs> Um, yeah, I love it. I'm going to use they, it. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they wanted us to each do a profile, and uh, we each did a profile. And, um, you know, then they called it into question, you know, after I decided on my own uh, to leave their little uh, page. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, I wasn't who I said I was. And, you know, well, I didn't see any tattoos that said, yeah, come on, you know, grow up. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, it's funny. A lot of people don't understand. A lot of the guys don't have the club tattoos. You know, that kept well, them that's under the, the table back in the day. Well, that's that's exactly right. I mean, a uh, guy that used to do uh, my my custom paint work in the Dallas area, and he was a member of the same club out of San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had one tattoo that was up on his shoulder that just had... Uh, uh, the club name, the insignia, and Dago on it. That's all he had. Now, there are more today. There are people that, uh, you know, put them on their neck and, and all over their chest, all over their back. That's their choice. I mean, I was 30 years old before I got my first tattoo, and it wasn't a club tattoo. Well, they also um, got to understand you were in radio as well. Well, exactly, and, and uh, uh, one of the stations uh, that I worked for in the little town I was in in California was owned and run uh, by Mormons. In fact, the owner was a bishop, the sales manager was a deacon, you know, the wife and daughter worked there, so you can bet your ass I didn't have any of those on, Right. you know, uh, well, yeah, and well that was my choice. It's not a, it's, at least it wasn't, it, it was not a club requirement. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, while we're on that subject, real quick, man, I want to send a shout out to all the families down uh, across the border that was slaughtered by those animals down there. You know, uh, cars were lit up with babies in there and lit up with women, and this was a military precise uh, 
hit job, if you ask me. But we just want to send our uh, prayers out. Hopefully, this country goes in there and starts bombing some crap, man. I know it's not our country, but when you go after American citizens, enough is enough. Well, I think I think uh, what they need to do is uh, uh, pull all our guys out of the sandbox because those people have been fighting over there for centuries and uh, put them where they're needed most, which is our border. And uh, uh, at Mexico's request, if it comes across our border then. Right. You know. Well, don't you, you know, I don't want to get into politics and stuff like that, uh, but this kind of goes with uh, the way the graybeards uh, were compared to this new generation. It seems like this country has went off its rocker. Well, and, and plus, they're not teaching the history that they taught us mm-hmm. in schools. You know, I mean, um, I, I uh, posted a story on my website this morning. Uh, my Facebook page, rather, and uh, <clears throat> it was about, you know, upwards of 50% have never heard of Mao Zedong. Uh, uh, <laughs> 20% have never heard of Stalin. Um, yeah. Why? You know? Right. Uh, so they all become an anti-war. They only see one side that's taught by the indoctrination people that we used to call teachers. Mm. And um, uh, I think... You know, if you if you read anything on the Communist Manifesto or any of those, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is dumb down the masses. Well, they're doing a pretty good job of it. Right. Now, how does that relate to this new crop of bikers coming in the scene, man? Because it's like I don't even recognize it anymore. Well, I think what it is a lot is the fact that uh, uh, kind of like uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, they don't, they don't trust anybody over a certain age. Uh, we're all, uh, full of shit. You know, we don't know what we're talking about. And, you know, it comes back to, uh, those who ignore their history are doomed to repeat it. Um, they don't, they don't get that. Now, that being said, I think it's more of a minority than a majority. I mean, when, when we were young, uh, uh, parents were led to believe that all teenagers were juvenile delinquents. Well, because the ones that were are the ones that made the news. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the kids that were doing well and graduating with honors and all that stuff, that was always in the back of the newspaper. That was never on the front page. Right. So hopefully this is a minority of young people uh, who will be voting that have enough sense to see through the rhetoric and the BS that's being put out by the media. Right. Well, as it relates to the new age of bikers, as I call it, it seems like they don't question stuff. You you know, your generation taught us to, okay, question and think it's bullshit until you verify it. These guys won't. And I actually see it on the Internet a lot where they follow guys that we can see through. Yeah, well, you know, it's... uh... It's kind of like if it's in print on the internet, it must be true. And, and, you know, they, they don't question it. And that's, uh, uh, that's part of the problem. Uh, I think the younger generation of bikers coming in, whether they're, um, uh, trying to be, uh, uh, sons of anarchy or Mayans or whatever, um, uh, they, they realize that, I mean, if you look at SOA, you know, um, uh, what did they do? They ended up killing the lead guy. Because he had turned out to be a bad guy. Well, they don't. They don't have any respect, for the most part, for those of us that went before them. Right. And it's true in in all levels of society. I think. Mm. Now you know it was funny how, and you were talking about that one group, and I won't give them uh, any advertising or stuff because I just you know what the group had a good purpose behind it. Yes. It did. Initially, they did. But when you get people in there that, especially on the streets, you know, these internet people don't understand. On the streets, we know these people. And when it comes to following somebody like that, when everything's laid laid out in front of them, hear from their former clubs, it's like, how can you people really follow a dude like this? Well, you know, I mean... um... How did how did people follow Jim Jones down to Guyana? Oh, you know, perfect example. I mean, you 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 sell them, 
you sell them a bill of goods, they buy into that. I mean, I was, I was disappointed that, that one guy that was in that group who lives here locally, who I've actually met in person, and he seemed like a nice enough kid, doesn't ride that much, but, you know, bottom line, he's still in that group. You know, and uh, um, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, nah, I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to tell on myself on something, and and then I realized it really doesn't matter. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. Now, do you think that blindness has affected the biker scene compared to when you came in? I think so. Yeah, because. Um, there were um, motorcycle enthusiasts, you know, uh, sometimes everyday riders, but certainly not bikers. And you understood who the bikers were. Um, when I lived in uh, Buffalo, New York for four years with my folks, um, uh, the group there in Buffalo that everybody talked about was the road vultures. Mm -hmm. And they then morphed into uh, a red and white chapter in Buffalo. And, uh, but, but those were the bikers. Uh, my brother was a member of Galloping Goose. Those were the bikers. Oh, that was old school. Um, and all the others were just motorcycle riders or enthusiasts. Mm. And now there's so many pop-up clubs. Everybody's got a choice. And if they don't see a choice they like, they start their own club right. with no respect to the fact that generally the way it was up until I left anyway, was you had to get permission from the dominant club. And they told you how many members you could have. Uh, they approved or disapproved your patch. They approved or disapproved the colors you used. And, I mean, it was all very logical and very peaceful. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you think uh, people join these things just because they want to be a part of something? Oh, exactly. That's exactly it. Everybody, I think everybody wants to be a part of something, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the Young Lawyers Association or a, or a bike club. Um, I think for a lot of us, the thing was we missed the teamwork, the camaraderie that we had in the military. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these young ones that are getting into clubs now um, haven't gone into military or if they have, you know, uh, they don't want to make the big commitment to a real uh, club, so they join a smaller one, and that can cause problems. Hmm. How does that? I talked my grandson out of it. He was going to uh, a good friend of his rides with a club, and da 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 da, and wanted him to join. And he told me what the club was, and I said, "You do realize that's a major support club." Uh, for the dominant club in your state. And I said, as soon as you start hanging with them and going to their parties and stuff, like you said in the video the other day, you're going to get profiled. They're going to know everything about you, your daughter, your mom, your stepdad, everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, you and, know, it's you funny. Know, when I did that video about uh, supporters for clubs, a lot of these un people don't understand. Once you throw on that support gear, you're labeled to that particular dominant. And if you're in the wrong area at the wrong time, like uh, a lot of people seen in that video, you're going to get yours if you can't stand up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so many people put that stuff on and just automatically assume they're part of that club. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're financing our parties. You know, you're right. giving us extra money to spend. The more support gear you buy, Shamu too, and uh, <laughs> you know, it looks like a big I candy mean, cane. You know, and I'm not disrespecting the club, but he looks like a candy cane, man. He just decked out in it. You know, red shoes, red this, red. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's he's a uh, he's a piece of work, <laughs> and and his old lady. Uh, uh, her, her behavior would not be acceptable, um, in, in clubs when I was coming up, mm -hmm. uh, your old lady was never the center of attention. You never heard her voice above everyone else's. Um, you know, 
she watched her language around kids the same as we did. Right. You know, and uh, when I met them, it was at a family-type restaurant, and she was running her mouth and cussing, and everything was a uh, polysyllabic word to the point that there was a mother and father and their four- or five-year-old with them out on the same patio, and I took it upon myself to go over to them and apologize for her behavior. Hmm. Now, her old man should have been doing that. Right, right. Uh, uh, but, well, you know, even okay. when I was up, you know, see, a lot of people call me a chauvinist, but the truth is uh, the lifestyle is a man's lifestyle, and it's been tradition for decades. And women, it was shut up and don't be heard. And if you got well, if you got out of line, the men were stepping in and taking care of that business. Well, yeah, I mean, I I had a girlfriend. Uh, first time I took her to the clubhouse, I ended up after about ten minutes taking her outside and saying, "Don't do that again," because she had plopped her ass up on the bar and was dominating the conversation. And I said, "Don't do that because you're embarrassing me." Mm. I said, "You know, just just play along." You know, and and it wasn't so much that we suppressed women as the point, at what you said, it was a male-dominated society, and in that type of group setting in a clubhouse, uh, you don't want a female dominating the conversation. Right, right. Well, you know, does that show, how can I say it, and nowadays, and people don't understand when I talk about the streets is... You don't want to show weakness on the streets. No. <clears throat> it's like, well, I told her, although I didn't have to tell her, she figured it out. I said, I'm going to be more of a chauvinist in public than I really am in private. Hmm. I said, you know, simple things like if you see me halfway up tipping that can of beer, there better be another beer ready for me to drink. Right, right. You know, and, and, and she got it. She got it real quick. I'll give her credit for that. Um, uh, she picked up on it. And so at the clubhouse, she was the perfect old lady. And at home, we were a good couple because we had mutual respect for each other. And that's all I was asking her to do was show respect. And unfortunately, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm all about women's rights and, and, and that sort of thing. I understand the premise behind it. Have an all women's club, well, okay then. You know, you got your own rules. Right. Um but in a male dominated group, generally speaking, you know, uh you, you don't want to be embarrassed, especially by uh your wife, girlfriend or either one of them. <laughs> now, do you think with the new, uh, some of the new club members, that is actually their downfall is some of the women because they don't know uh, how to stand up to them? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I, I could never paint with that broader brush. Um, I, I think, you know, the Internet's more of a problem than, than uh, uh, the females because usually what I've seen in some of the newer clubs is the women are all <clears throat> gathered over here at one or two tables talking and laughing and having a good time, and the guys are up by the bar, and they're talking and laughing and having a good time. And it's, it sort of separates itself that way. The women bond, the men bond, and then, you know, it, it creates a cohesive group. And I, I still see that. So that's right. a good sign. Right. Well, that is a good sign. Uh, but it, it's just... A, you, I can't understand when it comes to clubs patching women in because I think it's dangerous. Well, yeah, but I've seen that even back in oh, as early as the uh, probably middle or late seventies. There were some uh, acceptable or accepted clubs that did that. I mean, I knew a, I knew a club where I lived in Texas, and, and the difference was they were a family club. And, and that's, that's the, their initial, uh, drive was as a family club. So the women had patches too. They, they would have the, the top rocker, the center patch, and then the bottom rocker was usually like so-and-so's old lady. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And some clubs just have a bottom rocker that says so and so's old lady, and that's all. But uh, I I don't see a lot of clubs where where women are are patched into a man's club. Well, you know the 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 worrisome part of and you know because I always said you know they're going to have to defend that patch. What's going to happen when one of the broads are in the bar and they have to defend it? But I think you know family clubs is one thing, but what if they're wearing a support? Uh, patch on there with a woman well i mean it could be a problem but but generally i think only with other women i mean uh, i i just i still think there's a code of honor with men where if we've got a problem with this other group of men we're going to handle it between us and generally speaking if a woman even by accident gets hit, then it gets even worse. You know, I, I don't think, I don't think you're going to have many cases of, of the women joining in, you know, well, right. except big mouth. She, <laughs> she probably would. <laughs> you know, that was, you know, it sounds like that was a, a pretty crappy experience that you went through. Cause I know you came up uh, from a long way to meet some of these people to, uh, you know, just congregate and get to know each other, which, again, it's a great concept, but it sounds like it was uh, a pretty uh, bad deal. Well, I wouldn't say it was a bad deal. Um, <clears throat> there weren't as many people as I would have hoped would be there, and the main person was only there for about an hour. But uh, how did it? And what, and how? I got chest. I got chastised for it after the fact, after I dropped out because of, of the health things that I was going through and the weight that I started losing fairly quickly. Um, um, I flew up there and had a rent car. And so, you know, that was something they seized on. Boy, he didn't even ride up here. Well, now I knew some guys that rode up from Texas. Mm. Well, that's great. I just didn't have a 900 mile ride in me each way. Right, and, right, you, you know, I made no bones about it. I would have rather ridden. I had the time to ride. The problem was um, I just couldn't physically do it. It would have taken me five days to get there to mm -hmm. cover 900 miles. And, and Well, it just so, seems that was a hypocrisy at its best right now when the main guy was only there at an damn hour. And did he ride? Uh, no, no, no. Um, he, I don't think he's capable of riding anymore, and, and, and that's due to health reasons. Um, but at the same point, there were some people that showed up later, uh, one of whom I'm, I'm just really tight with, um, and they showed up um, after the sun went down, and everybody was gone but me. Mm. You know, they all left uh, before the music even started. You know, they, they left by 5.30 in the afternoon, and I was still partying. Right. I was like, what the hell, you know? Well, you would have and, thought that and, everybody would have been together the whole time, but, you know, I still well, yeah, get over a, the fact the guy was only there an hour, he's supposedly leading this group, and people are, like, still following that crap. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you know, it's uh, plus uh, his number two in command and the people from Texas were all staying in the motel right across the road from me. And yet I wasn't invited to go with them or whatever. And I went, that's fine, because I'm not through partying. You know, right. if they want to leave, you know, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, that's that's their choice. I mean, we got together, all of us, uh, around noon. And uh, then uh, uh, we all talked and sort of got along. And, and then the, the head dude showed up. And after he left, within 45 minutes. Everybody else left but me, and I was like, oh, okay, well, nice to see y'all. <laughs> and people paid, you know, traveling and stuff. People put some money out for this. Well, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. You know, it was uh, it was unfortunate uh, because uh, uh, the head dude was the one I wanted to meet and spend a little time with, and he was uh, sequestered with number two and uh, uh, one other guy. Mm. and didn't really talk to any of the rest of us. Right, right. And it was like, well, whatever, you know. Mm. Well, I, I, you know what, I kind of know why he left within an hour. Uh, it wasn't the best area for him to be in if he got caught up with something. 
Uh, so yeah, you know, then that, and that just right there, you know, should prove to a lot of people what they're uh, following. Well, you know, but as I say, you know, there's some people in there that, that, uh, um, that I knew or knew a very good friend of theirs. Um, is a good friend of mine in Texas that did most of my tattoo work and a good friend of his, um, uh, is, is a member of their, their group and, uh, does videos and whatever. And, uh, I know that if he had asked my friend, his friend about me, he would have, he would have learned the truth, but at the same point, he could not have set anybody straight or he would have been booted out. Right. right. Uh, one member that we've got in our group now, bikers and brotherhoods. Um, he reached out to me on email. He used to be a member of that group. And he said, I was kicked out for no reason. And I said, well, they did that with a lot of people. And, uh, because they thought they were the rats. And I said, funny thing is they still got rats. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> so, you know what? I get that stuff on a daily basis. And I laugh about that. <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. It's like, it's like, you know, the old adage about, you know, no sense whipping a dead horse. Well, you know, they're going to whip it till the cows come home. And apparently they're doing it on a secret, super secret channel now uh, because <laughs> they, they sure aren't putting anything out on their, on their uh, page. So right. I get I, reports on that. So. It, it's funny that uh, they don't they got a question. A, if you follow insane throttle, you can't join or some crap. <laughs> I think they do, yeah. I think that's uh, like the number three question. <laughs> you know, how, how freaking ridiculous is that when somebody tries to uh, tell you what you can and cannot do? I don't remember bikers ever allowing that kind of stuff, man. You know, you try to tell well, them what to do, go pound sand. Yeah, it's it's all changed, you know. I mean, um, you know, the there's been a long-standing law in the books, you know, that says uh, if you're a felon, you cannot associate with other felons. We had a, we had a standing thing in in uh, my club, and that was uh, I don't know your background, you know. So if a cop said uh, to somebody who was a felon, you're not supposed to be hanging with those people, he goes, I don't know who's the felon. Right. We don't talk about stuff like that. That's personal. <laughs> you <Right>. know. <laughs> Although there is a line in almost every police law that'll screw you on that too, which says ignorance is no excuse. But right. you know, uh, we didn't we we didn't do background checks on our people, and and quite obviously now they certainly aren't. Uh, other than to uh, weed out possible Leo trying to join their club right and they really only do an nsa background where you know i remember in the old days man it got real where not only were you doing the basic backgrounds but you had your pis going around following the guys making sure they weren't meeting with feds and it was hardcore back in the night early night oh yeah right? if you if you go online and and uh, look at uh, some of these clubs even even uh, a couple of the majors um and and see what their bylaws are and you see what the requirements are and what kind of background check they're going to do on you. It's like, Holy smokes. But it has to be that way because you know, uh, every time you turn around, Leo finds another way to get in. So, mm. well, that, you know what I always say for every three members, there's one in, you know, informant <laughs> infiltrator and, you know, that's why I don't understand why some of the officers, and I talk about this all the time, why the officers don't get smart and say, you know what, enough's enough of this. If you guys are going to do it, do it on your own and get it away from us because you're just bringing too much stuff down on us. And I actually did a story uh, the other day that was talking about how the feds busted into uh, an AOA's uh, garage and they tried to blame the. They brought the club into it, man. And it was like, yeah, you guys yeah. didn't have anything any damn way. Yeah, he had drill presses and stuff. I was like, wait a second, that's anybody's garage. And then they were talking about a lower on an AR-15 that didn't have serial numbers. Well, anybody could get them. So, but they used it to, you know, put a black eye on the club. So I yeah. don't understand why the <laughs> officers and all them. Just don't say, hey, man, we got nothing for it, you know. Brotherhood. Well, because they have to find something. And, and you know, if uh, I don't know about the major clubs now, I know we had a, uh, a running defense fund 
And a, a lot of our support gear money went into that defense fund because uh, we had a lawyer on retainer year round mm. uh, just for stuff like that. And uh, the problem is if they can't afford a really good attorney, if it's, you know, all for one, one for all, and every man for himself, well, you know, what happens is these people um, uh, can't get a good lawyer, and these are the ones that start making deals to mm. cut their time. Right. Well, you know, most of them still cut deals. Uh, but one of the things that I can't understand, and I'm not bashing any one club, is how they can support people within their clubs pushing meth, pushing the heroin. That You know what? That is just the lowest form to me is those type of people that push meth and heroin because it not, it not only destroys the person doing it, but it destroys whole families. Well, but but I think too, uh, because a, a lot of clubs now are are business organizations. Man, that's a that's a hell of a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you don't think about uh, what it's doing down the line. You look at all the money we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but in, at that same point, if they're business organizations like that, because I know there's the big debate, motorcycle club versus motorcycle gang, wouldn't that kind of stuff put them into the gang level? Well, yeah, it, I, I believe it does. And, and, and uh, um, you know, I mean, I'm not saying there weren't some of us that, that used drugs. God knows I did. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same point, you weren't dealing you know, right. uh, uh, you scored from somebody and it was personal use and, and, you know, it was, uh, but you know, somebody figured out, man, well, it's, it's the same as, as when I got out of the military and I was hanging around this park in, in the Dallas area. Uh, this was before I moved out to California and, you know, you could go to buy grass and to show you how times have changed, it was $10 for an ounce. <laughs> right. And you could give the guy $10 and he'd say, I'll be back in 30 minutes. He'd come back in 30 minutes and had your pot. Right. When then somebody figured out, well, I can collect all this money and I don't have to go back. I don't even have pot. Mm. You know, and, you know, somebody said, wow, there's big money in this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some of the, some of the clubs figured it out from, from, Organized crime. I mean, you know, they made a fortune when there was prohibition. Right. Now, you know, you know? one thing I, down those lines, and I think this is a good subject, because a lot of people, when I, uh, I, you know what, I always call it out for what it is. If you don't want to be labeled as that, then don't do gang stuff, you know, because you can't have it both ways. You can't have it where... You want the citizens to support you, but you got guys over here making uh, some money and doing some gang stuff. How can you even... That's hypocrisy to me. Well, it is, too. And for all the good you might do in the community, uh, 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 gathering coats for the coat drive or, or toys for kids at Christmas, it's all wiped out by one headline. Mm -hmm. You know, either either running guns or running drugs. It's all taken away. It, right. And if you'll notice, um, uh, the club I was in, very little press right. over the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and when it is, it's, it's usually a front page story for a day, and then it's figured out in court, and that's all there is to it. But it's not the huge, massive drug busts and whatever. Which, yeah, man, it, it, it not only gives a bad rep to your club, but also indirectly, I think, attracts some of these younger people who think, well, I'm smart enough to not get caught. Yeah, let me know how that works, how zippy. Well, a lot of these uh, clubs now are actually recruiting, actively recruiting gang members off the street. I oh, yeah. For a fact. Yeah. And I think that changes. Yeah, guys that don't even have bikes. Right, and I think that changes the dynamic to what a club used to be. Now, I'm all for motorcycle club rights, but lately it's been, how do I defend that kind of action? It's hard to do. It's hard to do. If if, if a club is taking in street gang members just to uh, amplify their numbers, you know, to, to appear bigger and stronger to 
Club B, um, um, it's stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, it, they're taking people in wholesale. I saw some of that with a club in Texas where they were just virtually handing out patches on the street corner. Right. And it was, it was kind of sad to see. And, uh, um, it's like, you know, what happened to the hang around the prospect period, all of that. I mean, in my club, it, it, you, you hung around for a minimum of six months, more likely a year. And the prospect period was generally two years. Right. They wanted to know everything there was to know about you. How is he, how is he straight? How is he, you know, when he's drunk? How is he when he's stoned? You know, uh, how does he ride? How, you know, right. Uh, you know, uh, what does he bring to the club? And, you know, uh, it was kind of like, uh, Navy SEALs. There were a whole, whole bunch that tried to get in and a whole bunch that didn't make it. Well, you Instead know, of just saying, well, the guy's got a bike, he rides pretty well, he's in. Or, he's a bad guy on the street, so he's in. Uh, boy, that's not much of a requirement. Right. Well, you know, a lot of times I'll say, you're only hurting the cause. Because there's a lot of organizations like Motorcycle Rights Foundation, uh, the COC's out there, Abate's out there. And anytime they take a step forward, it's always five steps back when some of this kind of stuff uh, happens. Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, I was, uh, I was a assistant executive, something or other for a bait in Arlington, Texas for a while. And it just became so political to the point that if somebody wanted to elect a new president, they brought in members from a hundred miles away, uh, to vote in the elections you know, uh, to get their guy in. And when I saw that going on and, you know, sometimes they, they just gave them slips of paper and, and a pen to write the name on. Well, how do you know that people aren't, you know, writing down two and three times, you know, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's, we, we trust everybody. And I went, okay. So I realized that that wasn't working for me either, you know, because I got somebody in there that all of a sudden didn't really care about what they were doing just wanted the power of being in that office. Right. Now, I did a poll earlier, uh, a massive poll, actually, and only, I found only 30% of independents and 30% of the biking community support motorcycle clubs anymore. And it's yeah. like, holy cow, why did this happen? Where did it happen? Does it have to do with all the information they're able to gather right away and they see uh, the violence, and they're, like, just turned off by it. Well, I, th- I think that's part of it. and and uh, But then again, that also explains uh, uh, the pop-up clubs, to me anyway. It's like, well, we don't want to be like those guys. We want our own club and our own rules, and we don't answer to anybody. <laughs> well, until you run into the dominant club, and then that story may change. Right. But do you blame them for that thinking that way? Well... Not, not really. Um, I mean, you know, they're influenced by what they see on the web. You know, I mean, I worked uh, with a girl on our morning show in, in uh, Texas that has never read a newspaper. And she's 30-something. Mm-hmm. And I went, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I, 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 I lay it back on the Internet. I think the Internet's changed a lot of it. I think... Uh, if it wasn't the internet, uh, most kids didn't read newspapers or follow the evening news. Um, I, I think it would have been a, a much better situation club wise, biker wise, uh, because you would have had people that sought out the truth and, uh, made their decisions based on what they, they determined to be true. And now they, they base it off of uh, what somebody else says is true, who they happen to think is some sort of motorcycle god, you know. Right, right. Well, you know what? I can't always, uh, you know, I know certain clubs do it, but I know the Midwestern clubs and, you know, the club you're around, they're really good freaking guys, man. And sometimes I don't understand why people don't go up to them and talk because they can learn a lot from these dominants. I know here in uh, Illinois, out in Iowa, out in Colorado, 
there's some freaking cool ass guys, man. So what that does when you go up to them is you not only get the education, but you get uh, the partying, you get the camaraderie. Uh, so, you know, on that other side of the spectrum, I don't know why they don't want to do it. Well, I think there's a fear factor there. Um, you know, because if you buy into SOA or Mayans, you know, uh, you, you didn't see any civilians coming up to them and, and talking to them and, and trying to get to know them, you know, and I, I think people are just like, ooh, those are bad guys. We'll stay away from them. Um, I, I just, I mean, I would see it occasionally with supporters who really wanted to know more, and some of those people ended up, you know, uh, going through the process and, and joining the club. Um, but you know, anymore, it's just, uh, you know, I, I'll buy the support gear cause it's cool. Uh, but, but I don't want to know anything about the club. I don't, I don't, these guys scare me. You know, I mean, mm. I gotta admit the first time I walked into a one percenter clubhouse on invitation, man, you could see my heart beating through my chest. I was like, well, what am I doing here? Right. But as I got to know these people and they were from several different clubs, um, Man, you know, there was a bond that was formed. And I went, you know what? These people, like my dad used to say, put their pants on one leg at a time. Right. You know, and um, um, I realized there were some really good people. I mean, there's some that I've known for 40 years or more. And uh, hopefully they hang on a while longer. But uh, uh, that's that's one of the problems, too. Uh, us old graybeards are dying off. And I'm just afraid that with all the new young blood that are coming into these clubs, it's going to get just horrendous in the next 20 years if they even still exist. Right. Well, that's the thing, man. You, you keep on seeing this kind of violence. You're already, you're, you know, you got, uh, you were in Texas and stuff. It's gotten pretty bad down there, man. They ain't playing around in Texas anymore. Well, and, and it's interesting too, because, um, you'll see a bunch of guys riding and uh, they're not flying patches, you know, and you, you're reasonably sure by the way they're riding and whatever that they are a club, but, you know, uh, a lot of them have chosen to go a little more incognito simply because Leo's watching them every step of the way. Now, do you think uh, within the lifestyle where it comes to Leo and clubs, you think Waco was the turning point? Oh, absolutely. In Texas, I know it was. And and unfortunately, some other states figure, well, that was Texas. That's not here because it hasn't happened there yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, oh, I definitely think that was a turning point. I mean, I knew guys that were in support clubs for one of the, uh, uh, for the dominant club in Texas at the time, and they quit wearing their support gear. You know, they just, they, they have no hats, no nothing, simply because um, um, everybody sort of went incognito. Right, right. Well, they're doing, you know, they I guess they're following what they do in Oz, man, because a lot of, they can't wear it over there and they go incognito, which I think that's the stupidest thing Leo could ever do was try to go after patches because if you're on that end, well, at least you know who they are. But when you when you, they don't have patches on or stuff, you don't know anything that's going on. So I think that's a stupid thing that they're doing over there. Well, it is. And, and they're thinking, you know, if they can get one club's patch, they can get them all. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, yeah, let's be out here, a thousand of us, all anonymous, and you figure out who the bad guys are, <laughs> you know. Uh, good luck going through your database in time to figure us all out. Right. Um, yeah, it is. It's a, it's a stupid move, but I understand what the government's doing, you know, uh, but it flies in the, in the face of the first amendment and, and I, I don't think it's going to work. Right. Right. Well, going down those, uh, lines, you know, I, uh, you know, I often bring up some of the creators that, uh, actually talk on the lifestyle, and it's like, yeah, wow. But you, you get some of these guys with the background that's only been riding a couple years trying to give advice. And I think that's another major problem as well. Well, yeah, there's like, you know, as well as I do, there have been <coughs> questions asked of us over the last couple of years, you know, um, or, or advice that was given out by some of these people like, well, if you meet somebody from a major club or whatever, you need to take your sunglasses off. Really? 
<laughs> I mean, come on. The one thing I will do is I will take the riding glove off my right hand because I'm going to shake hands with him. And, and I just, that's my own personal thing of, of respect of saying, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shake hands with you wearing a glove. Now, some, some, uh, uh, major club members, they don't care one way or the other, but that's me personally. It's the same as walking down the street with your girl and I walk on, on the side towards the street because that's what a gentleman does. Right. Um, you know, so that's my own personal respect. But yeah, you're right. Some of these people come up with these things, and I'm sitting back going, "What the hell are you smoking? Got to be better than what I'm smoking, <laughs> right?" <laughs> it's you know what? It's basically common sense, and people lost that. Well, yeah, yes, a loss of common sense in this politically correct society, which is bullshit. Uh, it's tyranny just disguised with words. Um, and and I I don't get it, you know I don't get it. I mean respect. I I will always give a patch holder respect until he gives me a reason not to. Right, right. And I don't care what club it is. I don't care if it was a club we were friendly with or a club we weren't friendly with. Hence my trip to uh, Chicago. Right. Well, you know what? Uh, this has been a hell of an interview, man. You know, closing remarks. What would you uh, think that's important that people uh, should know? Well, you know, it goes back to something I can't remember if it was my dad that first told me or a teacher. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If you think your question is stupid, I'll think you're stupid for not asking it. Right. Well, that's awesome advice right there, man. But uh, appreciate having you on the show, Judge. Uh, if you guys don't know already, go over to Biker and Brotherhoods. Don't forget the S at the end, man, because you'll come up with all kinds of stuff. And don't yeah. forget to answer the questions, because you ain't getting anywhere unless you answer them questions. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and the thing about it is, don't be a smart ass when you answer the questions. We get some people that answer all three questions, yes. Yeah, bye-bye, right. you know, or they answer two out of three. There is not, in my opinion, uh, as chief admin over there, there's not one question that will necessarily disqualify you. Rock and roll. Um, now, if you say you ride a particular brand of bike and there is no picture of you in that bike or or it's a picture from a, a dealership, you know, uh, you might get declined. Right. You know, I mean, I want real riders. I can roll, man. Well, awesome, man. Uh, I appreciate having you on. It was an awesome discussion. I know I'll have you on in the future. But everybody, you go out there and visit Bikers and Brotherhoods, get a hold of Judge. He'll talk with you, man. Uh, that's what all these gray beards are about. You to learn a lot from them. But uh, really appreciate having you on, buddy. All right. Well, it's always good to be with you, Hollywood. You have a good day, and uh, uh, you're not shoveling snow yet, are you? Yeah, man, it's freezing. It snowed out last night. <laughs> Well, it sucks to be you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. I'll uh, hit you up later. All right. Take care. All right, man. And that is Judge. And uh, it's always awesome to have Judge uh, on the line. Uh, real good guy. See, that's the Vietnam veterans for you, man. You to learn all kinds of stuff from them. Just love it. And in, in the new age of biking and brotherhood, like I always saw uh, say, People just lost them kind of values. It, it, it's so different than what it used to be. I actually feel sorry for the younger ones because, man, you guys missed some parties. You missed uh, the camaraderie. It was just awesome. And I think uh, with the protocol stuff, man, I know you guys are worried about going up to one percenter club. Don't be, man. They're pretty cool guys. Go up, discuss what you want to do, and you'll find it that you'll love it, man. You'll get all the parties to your clubhouse. You don't have to watch over your shoulders. Uh, that kind of stuff. So with that, I uh, appreciate you being on uh, the Motorcycle Madhouse. I'm actually thinking about going live again over on uh, the other platforms. Uh, I don't know, man. I'm thinking maybe Mondays, a Monday night or something. Do some lives, take some phone calls and stuff because everybody enjoyed that. Uh, but we've really been putting a lot of work in our radio show. That's why it's been uh, hard to do that. But we'll get that going again. 
But with that, uh, I'll talk to you later. Thank you for uh, joining us for this episode of Graybeards and Motorcycle Madhouse.